Hey guys, uh, welcome back for part two of your review for your test. Um, so we're going to get started now with the questions having to do with Southern society. So let's go with number one. Uh, how did the cotton gin affect Southern attitudes toward slavery? Okay, so um, this is a question about a change in attitudes. So we have to understand how the attitudes were before and then how the attitudes were after. So the cotton gin uh, was a machine that made it really easy to remove seeds from cotton and made it profitable to grow cotton all over the South. Uh, before the cotton gin was invented, slavery was on the decline and a lot of Southerners, even Southern slave owners, thought that slavery was wrong and should be eliminated. Um, after the cotton gin, when cotton it becomes super profitable and slavery spreads, uh, slavery starts to grow again in the United States and lots of people, uh, especially slave owners, start to argue not only is slavery okay, but they start to argue that it's actually good. And so this change in beliefs about slavery is also kind of just a function of the profitability of slavery. Before, slavery wasn't really productive, um, and so people thought it should be gotten rid of, but after slavery becomes super profitable because of the cotton gin, um, people start to like slavery again, in the South anyway. How did the rise of cotton affect Southern society? This is question number two. Uh, cotton was super important in the South. They called it King Cotton. Um, it the, the South produced 50% of the entire world's supply of cotton for a little while, um, and it was all because of slavery. And so the rise of cotton is synonymous with the rise of slavery throughout the South. Um, and so slavery becomes a huge thing, um, and it leads to a really unequal society in which a few really rich people with owning a lot of slaves make most of the money by growing cotton. And it hurts both poor, um, poor white people because they can't afford any good farmland because the rich white people buy it all up. And it also obviously hurts African Americans because it leads to a rapid spread and growth of slavery. Number three, what was the largest social group in the antebellum South? So a social group refers to a group of people who all make their money in the same way. Um, and so the largest social group in the antebellum South were non-slave owning whites. By 1860, by the year when the Civil War begins, um, there were uh, like 5.5 million non-slave owning whites. So they were by far the largest class and they lived very in very poor conditions because as I said, the slave owners bought up all the good land. So there was nowhere left for them to go except to the bad land, mountains, backwoods, places that weren't very fertile. So it was hard to farm there. Uh, number four, what was the smallest group in the antebellum South? The smallest group in the antebellum South was uh, the plantation owners. These guys made most of the money, but they represented a very small percentage of the population, like less than 10% of the population uh, owned owned more than 20 slaves. And these guys were the ones who were really raking in the money, uh, and they were making the money by kind of oppressing and pushing to the side uh, many poor whites, and by literally um, oppressing um, millions of African American slaves. All right, um, number five. What did plantation owners claim? Why did plantation owners claim to be more civilized than rich Northerners? Uh, this is kind of weird, but um, the plantation owners argued that they were more civilized because they did not have to work. Rich Northerners had to run factories and build railroads and all sorts of uh, hard stuff like that, whereas the rich Southerners didn't have to work. They just let their slaves do all their work. And they argued that this was better because it meant that because they didn't have to do uh, work, they could devote themselves to quote unquote higher matters, stuff like politics and art and um, learning and stuff like that. So a lot of America's early leaders, people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and um, John C. Calhoun were slave owners. And so these were guys who had devoted their whole life to politics because they didn't have to worry about money because they owned slaves who would basically make all the money for them. All right, um, six, what was life like for non-slave owning Southern whites? Um, well, to sum it up, it was, it was crappy. Uh, they lived in terrible poverty because they couldn't afford to buy good land because all that good land had already been bought up by rich slave owners. So they had to live in the backwoods and they could barely raise enough food to support themselves. So seven is a weird question then. 
uh, which is, why did even poor whites support the institution of slavery? Uh, so th this is weird because, um, so poor whites do support slavery. They're very pro-slavery in the, in the South. But slavery actually hurts them because, because of slavery, they, they have to live in these bad places with bad farmland because the rich slave owners have bought up all the good farmland. So you would think that poor whites would kind of want to get rid of slavery, that way they could have a better shot at having a good life. But instead, they support it. And there are two main reasons that they support slavery. One is um, they hoped one day that they could save up a bunch of money and buy slaves themselves, even though this was usually very, very unlikely. And two, uh, basically, racial prejudice and racial pride. Um, the free or the non-slave owning white people had been taught partially by the rich slave owners uh, that it was good to be white. They could so poor uh, non-slave owning whites could still take pride in being white, even though a lot of times they were as poor as the slaves that worked on plantations. Uh, so a combination of racism and sort of blind hope encouraged non-slave owning whites to support a system of slavery that hurt them almost as much as it hurt African Americans. Um, let's see here. Eight, what challenges did free African Americans face in the South? Okay, so there were a lot of free African Americans in the South, 250,000 by around the time of the Civil War, but life wasn't great for these guys. They had very few political rights. Um, they weren't like allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to testify in court against white people. And um, they were also at constant uh, risk of being kidnapped and sold back into slavery. So life was not great for free African Americans in the South. Number nine, what led to the increasing numbers of slaves in the South from 1800 to 1860? Uh, basically, we already answered this. It's the cotton gin and the spread of cotton. Cotton cultivation is uh, lends itself to slave labor because it's performed by big groups of workers that can be easily supervised out in the fields. So um, cotton and slavery kind of grow together from 1800 to 1860. Number 10, why did Southern whites prevent slaves from receiving an education? Uh, basically, Southern whites didn't want slaves to become educated because they were worried that if slaves learned to read, they would learn to organize, and then they would be able to uh, carry out a successful slave rebellion and end slavery. So by keeping slaves ignorant, they were able to control them and keep power over them because knowledge is power. Uh, so they didn't want slaves to become intelligent, or uh, they didn't want slaves to become well-educated because um, educated slaves would be harder to control than non-educated slaves. Um, number 10. Why did Southern white, or wait, number 11, why did the most dangerous jobs, why were the most dangerous jobs done by poor whites rather than by slaves? Um, the reason that, so if you had to do something really dangerous like dig a mine or blast through some rock using like dynamite or um, like construct, construct a house uh, where like you'd have to put a roof on and you could fall off and stuff, uh, slave owners would not use their slaves for these dangerous jobs. Instead, they would hire poor whites because uh, slaves were a big investment. The average slave cost about w what would be worth, or like if you converted that time's money to today's money, would be worth about $50,000. So what that meant is that um, if, if you like had a slave die doing a dangerous job, you would be out $50,000. It's like you crashed your new Mercedes. Uh, so in so they, they view their slaves as a, an expensive investment, which means that they don't just uh, kill them for no reason. Instead, they hire a poor white guy because if the poor white guy hurts himself, they don't lose any money. Um, and then they can just hire a different one and he can keep going. So slaves were viewed as an investment and this meant that their safety was um, taken into consideration for like what sorts of jobs they did. Uh, 12, what sort of punishments could disobedient slaves face? All sorts of terrible stuff. Uh, the most common form of punishment was whipping. In fact, 
whips became a symbol of uh, the slave owning class, a symbol of their authority. But really, really terrible stuff could also happen. There was uh, there were things called slave masks that would be put on disobedient slaves that would like cover their whole face with iron, and there'd be like a spike that went into their mouth that would like prevent them from swallowing or talking. And this was supposed to be a, an extremely terrible punishment. Um, and then on top of that, there was stuff like um, mutilations. You could lose an ear. You could have like all sorts of terrible stuff happen to you. And um, yeah, is is terrible and demeaning. And yeah. Anyway, thirteen. Uh, how did enslaved African Americans influence American religion and music? Uh, in a lot of ways. So um, they influenced American. Uh, religion with a particular kind of preaching and church going style. Uh, the preaching, uh, instead of just a guy like kind of reading from a book, was a very emotional kind of preaching with this sort of call and response thing where um, the preacher would say something and the crowd would kind of yell back or affirm what the preacher was saying. And this style of preaching um, is still going on today in a lot of African American churches and has even spread into broader Christian circles. Um, African Americans had an incredible influence on American music, and they still do today. Um, but basically, if it wasn't for African American influences, we would not have the genres that we have today in jazz, blues, rock, uh, R&B, hip hop. All of that stuff comes from African American rhythms, African American styles of music, um, even stuff like bluegrass was influenced by African-American rhythms and also African-American instruments like the banjo that was originally an African instrument. So without African-American American influence, American music would be way more boring than it is today. Um, 14. What were four different ways that some Southerners resisted the system of slavery? The four different ways are abolition. There were Southern abolitionists that wanted to get rid of slavery. Um, then there was passive resistance, which was where slaves would kind of sneakily get back at their masters when nobody was looking by like breaking equipment or slacking off or stealing food. Um, there was escape, where a slave could try to run away to the north, and this was helped by the Underground Railroad, which was a system of safe houses to help slaves escape. And finally, there was rebellion, which was the most dramatic form of resistance, where slaves would rise up and try to kill the masters and end slavery. And uh, rebellions never actually really worked. Um, the most successful rebellions only ma managed to kill, you know, um, maybe a couple dozen white people before the rebellions were put down. Uh, but so those were the four different ways of um, resisting. Fifteen. What were some of the small ways that slaves could fight back against their owners in daily life? I already answered this one. Passive resistance. They could break equipment, they could slack off, and they could steal stuff from their masters. Uh, those are the three big ways you could passively resist. Um, okay, so 16. How did small but regular acts of resistance limit the usefulness of slavery? Basically, how did passive resistance uh, limit the use of slavery? What this meant is that uh, because slaves would only work when they were being directly supervised, and if they weren't supervised, they might steal or break equipment, um, this meant that slavery could only really be used for a couple tasks that um, were easily supervised. Stuff like working out in the field where, you, where one guy could watch a whole bunch of slaves working, or like working in a house. Um, and so this limited the spread of slavery because it meant that other jobs that might have been done by slaves could not be done by slaves because they simply would not do it. Um, and so passive resistance was really important because it kept slavery from becoming bigger than it already was. 17. How did the Underground Railroad affect relationships between the North and the South? So the Underground Railroad, like I said, was a system of safe houses set up by abolitionists. Many of these abolitionists lived in the North. And so um, when the South found out about the Underground Railroad, the plantation owners were extremely angry because they viewed it as the North attacking and stealing their property. So basically, um, they, they thought that the North was helping the slaves to run away, which a lot of Northerners were, and this made the Southerners really angry, and they started to accuse the North of being aggressive and attacking them and stealing their stuff. And this really hurt relations between the North and the South and helped to lead to the Civil War later on.
and 18. How did slave rebellions affect the relationship between whites and blacks in the antebellum South? Okay, so slave rebellions never succeeded, um, at least not in America. In some other places, like the island or the um, the country of Haiti, there actually was a successful slave rebellion where they drove the white slave owners out and declared an independent nation. But um, in the United States, slave, the slave rebellions never worked and they were usually put down pretty quickly. Um, slave rebellions were really historically important though because they scared the southern white people. And basically what happened after slave rebellions is laws for African Americans would get harsher. And so a lot of rights, both of slaves and of free African Americans were taken away after slave rebellions. Um, and this was because white people were scared uh, that a larger slave rebellion would break out and uh, basically kill, kill all of the white people, or most of them, or force them to leave their homes at least. And so they started making more and more oppressive laws to make sure that a slave rebellion would be impossible. So they, they made it illegal to teach African Americans to read. They made it illegal for African Americans to own weapons. Um, they took away all the free African Americans' political rights and stuff like that. So slave rebellions actually in the short term hurt African Americans because it made the Southern whites pass oppressive laws. All right, so those are all of your study guide questions. Um, so you guys should be good to go now. You now have all the information you need. All you need to do now is remember all of this stuff. So hopefully you've been writing it down, you've been checking your study guide, and now you have the whole weekend to go over this information so you can get an A on my test and improve your grade for the quarter. So good luck studying, guys. Thank you for watching all of this, and I will see you guys on Monday for the test.